Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. So good to be here with you, Bernie. And with you, sir. <laughs> always. Always. Um, again, thanks for coming. And uh, I just love this book, which I've, you. I've showered him with praise about it. It's, um, it's such a warm, personal account. It's like a letter to a friend. Um, I was curious if you had a tone in mind or if you just sat down and this is you writing personally for us. No, just really stream of consciousness. I mean, I literally wrote what I felt like writing at the time. And it was, I mean, as the title, Scattershot, um, it came from all over the place, and I, as I've stressed uh, countless times, you know, I did not want to write an A to Z uh, memoir. I wanted it to be uh, non-linear, and I wanted it to be conversational in the extent that um, I just, I literally wrote about what I felt writing about at the time, you know. I mean, I didn't, I didn't set myself any particular goals. No. Yeah. You are not somebody that's out there being interviewed a lot. You kind of... I am right now. You are now. <laughs> We're catching up. We're catching up. But when we did our documentary on the wonderful album, The Union, um, I, I just felt, you know, interviews were not something that you fled into the arms of. Um, you kind of were a little shy about it. And that wonderfully serves the book because these stories are not well-told, often-told tales. Right. It's like if you got to know Bernie and you had this dinner, maybe, where, where you just started talking about a life. And that's such a beautiful way to invite people into telling your story. Um, I also wanted to say that there's a cinematic quality to it that uh, really comes to play in the beginning years when you're talking about meeting Elton mm -hmm. and the tenderness of that friendship. And I wondered if it felt that way to you as you were writing it, like it was kind of your Truffaut movie, your personal story that well, lived in visuals. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've always thought of myself as somewhat of a cinematic writer, so hopefully that sort of fell over into the book. Um, I didn't consciously uh, attempt to write it in that way. I really literally, as I say, I mean, it sounds fairly straightforward, but I enjoyed the process so much. It was so enjoyable. I mean, uh, in a different way than creating songs. I mean, obviously songs are much shorter in their narrative, whereas this, I could really stretch my legs and move forward very, uh, and it was very rapidly. I mean, I, I, I have to stress that the, the way that the, I, I didn't sit down initially and say, okay, I'm gonna write a memoir. I'd actually written a magazine piece for, um, for Bazaar magazine, and um, it had been received so well that, and I'd enjoyed the process of doing it, that I, I attempted to write a few more sort of prose pieces. Yeah. And I suddenly really came to the conclusion that, oh, what am I doing? I'm, I'm actually writing a book here. And at the same time, I di as I say, I didn't want to write it in a chronological sent sense. I just wanted to write it write about what I felt writing about at the particular time, if it was an event that happened somewhere between A and Z in my life, yeah. and I felt about writing about that in one particular day, I would do that. And it was almost like being, on a, being psychoanalyzed, being on the couch, because the more I wrote, the more I remembered. 
yeah. which was very interesting because my memory is not particularly good, and I think that's probably why the book is nonlinear. You know, I mean, it's all over the place geographically. And I just feel that that's more enjoyable, and it's, it's yeah. not the preconceived way that people normally uh, construct these kind of books. Well, it's a beauty, and I'm going to uh, skip around a little bit and be nonlinear as well. Good. good. <laughs> nonlinear so, away. Let's do it. Um, there are some real nuggets in this book, you guys, like things that you, you didn't really know that you never knew, but now you know them. And one of them is that you and Elton wrote a song specifically for Sinatra right. called Remember. Yeah, it wasn't very good, though. I love Remember. <laughs> you can find it no, on No, actually, it wasn't. I, I thought it was called September. Oh, it's called September? I think so. Well, they rhyme, don't they? It's they do. Remember Sep they Maybe do. it's called Remember September. Okay, we'll check it out. I, yes, exactly. All I say, I say, all I can remember is that it wasn't very good, but I think he actually also uh, sang Sorry Seems to be the Hardest Word at one particular point in yeah. time. But this was the one that we had written specifically for him. Yeah. And the great thing about, as most people know about Sinatra, he always when he performed a song, he would always credit the arranger and the songwriter. Yeah. And as I say in the book, he's the only person in my entire career that actually pronounced my name with the French pronunciation. And I'm haunted on what the French pronunciation is. Well, he said it better than me, probably, but it, it's actually Tupin. Oh. Which, it, which roughly translated means the little mole. And, and being that I've, I've drawn so much inspiration from things that are under the ground as opposed to above the surface, um, I think it makes sense. Well, well done. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you went backstage, uh, you went to see him with Alice Cooper, right. and you go backstage and you have this moment with him. Right. And uh, you, you write about it beautifully. It's almost like the molecules that are Frank Sinatra are oh, present absolutely. in front of you. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean... Uh, I don't think the cream always rises to the top, and, and he was the cream, believe me. Uh, but I always remember when, he, when he's, he put his arm around me, and it was like, I really felt like a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> it was like, you know, you got that stupid grin on your face, you know, you're looking at Frank Sinatra with his decades of history, and, you know, there's the chairman, and he's eyeball to eyeball with you. It's... it's it's daunting, to say the least. I can imagine. You are kind of zealig in the book, and you, you, you kind of give us a front row seat to a lot of the huge legendary people that passed through your life and still do. Um, Dolly, you write about Salvador Dolly, mm -hmm. which is remarkable. I, I invite you all to check out the passage about how Dolly gives him an original on a napkin, I believe. Yeah. Um. <laughs> That, that was one of the high points, exactly. Well, Dali in himself was, I always thought of him as a complete carny. Uh, I mean, a fantastic, I mean, a fantastic charlatan. Yeah. But an amazing draftsman. I mean, extraordinary. And yeah, he, we, we were having dinner one night with a group of people, and on the table, there was all kind of ephemera on the table, like lipstick and burnt corks and mascara and things like that. And as he was taught, he had this maddening way of talking to you because he would speak in English and then suddenly transfer into Catal... I don't know, he was a Catalan, so it was Catalanese or whatever, you know, it was this weird... But he'd just gravitate from one language to another, <laughs> so you'd never get the punchline of anything he was saying. Fantastic. Um, but I don't think he was telling any jokes. Well, <laughs> he was amusing enough in himself. Anyway, as he was talking to me, he was taking all these things and drawing on a napkin, sketching, but he wasn't even looking at the napkin. And I was sort of <coughs> in you know, two minds there, I'm trying to concentrate on him and what he's drawing. And it was this fantastic piece of art, you know, made with all of these uh, objects on the table. And at the end of the dinner, he sort of, he got up to leave and he picked it up and he threw it in my lap and said, for you, poet. And 
which he was only, only one, one of the only people I would allow to call me a poet, believe me. Uh, I wasn't going to argue with him. Anyway, so I, I quickly <coughs> shoved it into my inside pocket, lest anybody else see it, because I didn't want anybody else to run off with it. And I, I took it back to my hotel room, and um, I, I threw it on the sideboard, uh, went to bed, got up the next morning, and went out for a walk. And I came back, and the maid had laundered it. <laughs> Just a heartbreaking moment from Scattershot. As I'm walking through the park, I'm trying to think of all the different ways I can uh, preserve it, you know, all the, the things I can do, you know, <coughs> put it behind whatever, and then you get back and there's a napkin. Hilarious. Hilarious. Um, skipping around a little bit, when did you realize that Elton was going to be an explosive live performer? Wow, that's a good question. Um, he, he was pretty good from the get-go. Um, and I'm not really sure what motivated him to do the theatrics on stage from day one. Um, obviously, he was, uh, you know, he'd, he'd taken a lot from his heroes, obviously, Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis. And as he's always said, you know, gu guitarists have it lucky because they can move around. You can't drag a piano around. Yeah. So you have to basically attack a piano as opposed to dance around. And I think, again, it was, it was all part of that uh, backlash against his upbringing where he wasn't allowed to, you know, wear loud clothes. His, his father, his real father, you know, wouldn't allow him to wear hush puppies or suede or of anything of that nature. So I think his whole persona, as he developed as a stage performer and a singer, was in some way a rebellious act towards that sort of oppression that he'd had when he was a child. Um, but I, I was, personally, I was always uh, impressed by the way that he sort of his, his um, stage act progressed, and he just... I mean, he was always a great singer, you know. I mean, he's, he's probably even a better singer now than he was back then. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, he's an extraordinary live performer. There's no doubt about it. But it, it definitely uh, improved with time. I think it became more of a sort of professional thing than a, a free-form uh, dance to be noticed. Yeah. When we talked the other night, you said something that was fascinating, which is the, the early 70s albums, of course, they're revered and loved, but you have a strong affection for the later albums, like Peachtree Road, Songs from the West Coast, and um, is it that all of the things you're talking about, the kind of deepening of the passion of the singing and your writing just becomes clearer over time? Yeah, I, th I think our, our albums have sort of um, definitely changed with the decades. I mean, there seems to be this um, intense reverence for the 70s albums, which I, you know, I understand, and I, but I find interesting at the same time because uh, for the most part, they're very good, I think, but there are several that I don't, I, I don't believe are as good as people probably ima imagine they are. You know, the thing is, if you grow up in a certain decade, you, you tend to align yourself with the music of that particular period. It's like when people say, oh, there's no great music today, you know. Yeah. They're the, usually the people that are from a different generation. And that's unfortunate, but the thing is, I think as, as our albums have changed, you know, they've changed with our personalities. They've changed as we've grown uh, and into our sort of autumn years, if you will. You know, we're not in the winter years yet. We're, we're sort of autumn right now. Perfect. We've done, we've Seems done, you know, spring, spring and summer. <laughs> let's let's just call it autumn. But um, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think there's a sort of much more. Um, it, it, they come from a more adult place now. Uh, I think they're befitting gentlemen of our age. Mm -hmm. um, they have a certain intelligence to them. 
that I think is very different than the, the people we were in the 70s, and we were very different then. I mean, if you think of the early albums, like, you know, Mad Men Across the Water especially, that was an album that was forged from our uh, initial foray into the United States. It was the first album that was made after we'd come to the States, and I think from uh, for many reasons, it's probably the most American album we ever made wow. because they were all vignettes of life that I was seeing, that I wanted to see and wanted to witness, and they were, they were part and parcel of, of road trips that I took. You know, one of the first things I did when I came to the States, I didn't just hug my uh, whole persona to, to Los Angeles, I wanted to move out, and I took road trips all over the place, and so many of those songs on that album, um, you know, come from my travels, and it, as I say, it was the, really the first album of experiences that we had in the United States. Wow, if you've never come to California or the States, the mind reels as to uh, what you're working Yeah, we could have gone to China. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That would have been interesting. I like it. Um, you, you mentioned in the book, and I thought this was great, that you had an early attraction to flawed characters, which came from Graham Greene. Right, And, and right. that allows the work to stand up with richness over the years. Well, I always, I always think flawed characters are far more interesting. You know, the sinner sometimes is more interesting than the saint. And I don't mean that, in the, I, I mean that in a sort of a metaphor as opposed to the, the real sense. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, as I, I think I say in the book, uh, it always makes me think of uh, Lynch's movie Blue Velvet, yeah. the opening of the, the movie where you see the pristine lawns and the, and the sprinklers and people getting the newspaper and the kids playing, and then the camera pans to underneath the ground and you see the worms and the dirt and the earth. That's where the interesting characters are. Well said. Are there words that you know Elton can't sing or doesn't want to sing? <laughs> <laughs> um. We were doing a score with, with Yonzi in one of our movies, and, and a word was suggested to him, like gratitude or something. He's like, I can't say that word. I can't sing the word that, gratitude. That's right. I've, I, don't, I don't recollect that ever happening. Um, I... <laughs> I do remember, I was thinking of this the other day, um, when we, there was a track we did or a single we did called Philadelphia Freedom, um, which, which uh, our friend Billie Jean King had asked uh, Elton to write. And now Billie Jean had a, t uh, a tennis team called the Philadelphia Freedoms. And... Um, she said, would, would you consider writing a song, you know, for our team? And Elton's answer was, there's no fucking way I'm going to get Bernie Taupin to write about tennis. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the reverse answer to your question, right? But well done. But well I, done. Can't, I can't think of any words. No, that, that's a really good one. But for the life of me, no, I can't think you of You have one. utter freedom, Philadelphia included. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> well, while, while you're mentioning a couple things, I want to do a flash round with you and mention a few songs and just, uh, you know, this, your immediate reaction. Doesn't have immediate reaction? Immediate reaction. I have to remember them. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. From Tumbleweed Connection, Amarina. Okay, well, the first, thing, the first thing that comes to mind from that is Dog Day Afternoon. Oh, because wow. Because I always... It astounded me that they used that song in Dog Day Afternoon. It didn't seem to correlate to the movie whatsoever. Yeah. But now I can't imagine the movie without it. It's very bizarre. Yeah. And it's me again inventing people's names. You know, I, that, again, wow. I, um, I don't know where Amarina came from. It's, it's, actually, I love that song. Um, and I don't know if we've ever done it that much on stage. I can't remember. I think we did probably back in the early days, but uh, it hasn't been, hopefully, if we ever do like a, a, um, a deep cuts concert somewhere, you know, I, we won't be doing a tour. 
<laughs> we won't be touring. Okay, let me get that straight. If we ever do a one-off like uh, uh, somewhere, that could be definitely something that I'd, I'd love to do that. that would Fantastic. Be Same album, Come Down in Time. Well, that's the anomaly on that particular album because it's the one song I don't think fits on the album. It's a great song. I love the song. But it's, it seems like it's something that might have been on the Elton John album, the Black album, rather than Tumbleweed. It doesn't really seem to gel with the rest of the Americana slanted material, Civil War, Western right. material. It, in, in fact, it's, very, very, it's a very English song. It's almost like a madrigal. You wow. Know? I'm glad you put it on the album. Um, All the Nasties. Oh, well, that was a song that, that was my first sort of defense song for Elton. That was on Mad Men, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was written in not defense of his people t alluding to his, starting to allude to his sexuality. So what happened was I would have thought on the contrary that the British music press would have lauded him for taking our material to the United States and competing, you know, because at the time in England there was only really a couple of singer-songwriters, um, and that was, I think, basically Elton and Cat Stevens, I mm -hmm. think, as he was then. Um, and we were the only ones making waves in the United States where they had people like obviously um, James Taylor and Paul Simon and all of the, those kind of people of that ilk. So I found it strange that they would sort of take pot shots at him. And um, so, yeah, that was my, sorry, it's a long way around, but uh, that was my sort of defense of my friend. Wow, there's an amazing demo version of it on one of the box sets that you guys put out. It's just a beautiful song. Yeah, I never listened to those. I, 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 maybe I should start <laughs> trying to. Check it out. Um, I Want Love. Wow, okay, that's probably one of my favorite songs we've ever written. Um, Definitely, without a doubt, uh, it's in my top five. Uh, I think if I'm going to toot my own horn lyrically, I think it's one of the best lyrics I've ever written um, because I think it comes... We gotta go there. I think it, it comes from a place of anger, but when you listen to it, you can see that the person that singing the song doesn't really believe what he's saying. Mm. He wants, I mean, I know it says I want love and it's a sort of anti-love song, but the guy singing the song, that person really does want love, but he, he's so wounded at that particular time, he's gonna pretend he, won't, he doesn't. I know that's sort of pretty con convoluted, but uh, that's re I, I love that song. Same here. Tiny Dancer. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the first really real California song wow. that, we came, that we came up with, again on the Mad Men album. Uh, very much a composite of, of different characters I met at the time. Um, and, uh, but I, I sort of wanted it to, to boil it down to sound like one particular person. But I, I don't think of it I, I've never thought of Tiny Dancer as a, a particularly as a love song. I, th I, I think of it more as a sort of uh, homage to Los Angeles at the time. Wow. And thank you, by the way, for putting it in your movie and giving it a new <laughs> lease of life. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for letting me use it. I am a golden <laughs> god. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, so... I have, a, I have a question from my friend Heidi, who I gave my copy of Scattershot. I've read her book. Yes, Heidi, Heidi took uh, your book on, the, on a vacation in Greece and took pictures of it at the, in the ruins and all over Greece and kept sending me pictures of Bernie's book. It sounds like my book. <laughs> Which she, it's well-traveled. Um, but she became fascinated with the book as well. And she had a question, which is what happened to Ralphie, your um, chauffeur for a time that you got very close to, and then one day he disappeared. And it's a poignant 
Thing well, that, that that's that's the that's the big question, that, and that's yeah. poised in the book. Um, I th that was the sad thing. I don't know what happened to it. But you knew him. He so just well. basically disappeared. You'd shared like many personal moments, but you realized that you didn't know how to find him. Right, and and the car company were very elusive about it, which I never understood. But you have to understand that the the character that we're talking about there is in a chapter called Ralphie and the Dali, and my whole idea of the chapter was balancing an average Joe's life against this sort of contemporary firebrand artist, you know, and how basically, and I, I sort of balanced the two characters together, and the, the sad thing is I knew everything about Dali, and ev as everybody did, and I actually only knew the surface story of Ralphie, you yeah. know, who was my driver for years in New York and was the salt of the earth. But when he just didn't appear one day, I had no idea how to get a hold of him. If he had a family, well, I think I knew he had a family, but I didn't know where he lived. And, and I knew that he just wanted to retire and open a pizza joint in Atlantic City. But uh, it's, it's sad that to think that somebody like that passes away and after a few months, nobody knows that they ever existed, whereas Dali is still known today. And as I say in the book, you know, uh, Ralphie was a diamond and Dali was just rhinestones. It's, it's, yeah, it's part of the charm of the book is that you give equal weight to someone like Ralphie and to Dali or Alice Cooper or somebody like that. And well, I'm rooting I, for Ralphie to show up. Yeah, and I, I also, one of the things about the book is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about saying that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a name dropper's delight. Well, you, you don't live the kind of life that myself and my contemporaries live without celebrity quota in, in your life. But at the same time, what I wanted to do with this book was incorporate characters who have existed throughout my life that are not famous. Yeah. And I tell stories about them as much, if not more, than I do about celebrities. Yeah. And that's, again, you know, it's the middle ground of the book. You know, you're either going to go, well, I don't want to hear about this, but I, I, or you're going to say, I think it's fascinating. So that's really, you know, the critical element. Do you want to hear about interesting characters yeah. or do you just want to hear about celebrity? And sometimes it's just celebrity. So um, I, I tried to give equal time to people that mattered in my life. I feel like you're always on duty as a writer reading that book. Is that correct or not so correct? Well, I'd like to think so. Yeah, I mean, as I say, and I've said it countless times, you know, I, I like telling stories. I'm uncomfortable with the terminology of songwriter and lyricist. I loathe poet because that's the last thing I am. Uh, and as I say, it's an insult to genuine poets. Um, <laughs> no, but there's a big difference. Writing, creating lyrics and creating poetry are two very, very different things. You want a poet? Listen to Leonard Cohen, you know, as wow. I say in the book. He's the only person that I regard as a recording artist who is a poet, you know. I'm sure many people would think of Dylan, you know, and maybe some of his earlier stuff, the more esoteric sort of rambling stuff is, is a bit Ginsbergish yeah. in its poet poetic sense. <laughs> but, but no, I, I like to think of myself as a storyteller, as a cinematographer. Yeah. I adore writing. I love telling stories. Yeah. You are a master, as they say. Um, so I did a little research, and I Isn't wanted to... Isn't that the name of Jan Wenner's book? I guess so. <laughs> we, we, um, we'll be right back with more. <laughs> um, so I did a little research, Bernie, and the first known love song was written on a tablet in 2000 BC, found in Mesopotamia, and uh, I did that. <laughs> deciphered in 1959, one of your early pieces. I look good for my age. It's, 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 it's very good. It's written from the point of view of a, of a young woman in love, um, and I believe with child. And she writes in this love song, lad of my heart, my beloved man, your allure is a sweet thing, as sweet as honey. You've captivated me. Of my own free will, I will come to you. Man, 
Let me flee with you into the bedroom. You have captivated me. Of my own free will, I shall come to you. 4,000 years later, what makes a good love song? Sounds a lot better than your song. <laughs> wow. Um, Man, honesty, let me flee with honesty, you. Honesty, and that sounds like honesty to me. Uh, wow. nothing, nothing beats honesty. You know, it's like, again, um, the, the story of the creation of your song, uh, which, yes, I did write very quickly. But I, 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 in, in reflecting on it now, the more I think about it, and, and in this promotion on this book, you know, you have time to reflect on certain high points in your life, obviously. And the more I think about it, you know, I think the reason that your song has that sort of conversational tone to it is because I wasn't really sure what I was writing. And it was almost like I was punctuating it with my uh, inability to understand how love worked. And it, it has this naivety to it that came from a really honest place. And um, in the same way as you, I always think of the person that wrote your song as the same person who maybe 40 years or 30 years later wrote Sacrifice. It's the same character, only it's bookended by, it's that guy who's gone through the mill romantically on every level, and Sacrifice is that same person, but it's a much tougher, harder uh, viewing of relationships. And again, Sacrifice, that's probably along with I Want Love, yeah. Probably one of my favorite songs. Because it, they're honest. They completely come yeah. from an honest place. Absolutely. Great answer. Just a great, great answer. Do you ever hear the music back for one of the songs and, and, and feel like he missed it? No. No. I mean, the thing is that when I write, I mean, not in the early, early days, but I would say for the last um, 45 years, I, I write with a guitar, you know, it's, it's almost a, like a security blanket, but it's just in order to give me some sort of rhythmic feel to the lyric that I'm creating. So yeah, in my mind, I've got my version of the song, but I never, I never put that forward to Elton. I mean, you know, he's the melodic master and that would be treading on his toes in the same way as he never questions what I write. I mean, it, what I write is pretty much the way it ends up being, you know. In the early days, yeah, I mean, maybe I overwrote several things and we cut verses out, but uh, usually what I give him, it's what ends up, uh, you know, melodically as one uh, entire piece. But uh, yeah, I, he, he never disappoints. When, when, uh, when we did the documentary, one of the things that he said was, um, come and film me writing, because I've never been filmed writing before. So I did get to see part of your process. And you guys worked um, very specifically on the song Gone to Shiloh, I mm -hmm. remember, which just got richer and richer as you worked on it. You brought Neil Young in for some vocals. It's got your tape recorder on it, too. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Yeah, the opening stanza is, wow. is uh, I think, recorded on your that's tape recorder. That's right, that's right. Wow. Well, that was, that was an example of you guys really digging in and crafting a song. And often it's not like that. Do you like when, you're able to, when Elton is able to spend more time crafting one of the songs? Because yes, sometimes he loves to just blitz through them, I gather. Yeah, well, he takes great pride in doing that. And sometimes I've said to him, you know, that's, that's great. But if, if you want to slow it down a little, you know, yeah. maybe uh, you're going to hook into something that's quite memorable. And I think, I, yeah, I think if he, w what he does is, you know, he will take, I will present him with, if we're going to make a record, I will present him with maybe 20, 25, sometimes 30 lyrics. Wow. And um, he will sift through them, and the things that stick out to him, he, he will see a title that he really likes, 
and he will gravitate towards that, or possibly the beginning of a, a chorus that he it catches his eye. And he will, I've seen him take things and, and start them and then go, no, no, this, I can't work on this one right now. I like it, but he'll put it aside. If it's not immediate to him, <laughs> he may move, us, move on. Wow. So, um, and then, you know, he'll, he'll see something and it'll be like that. You know, he'll write it from top to bottom without stopping. And, um, and that's, that's the magic of the way he writes, you know, and I'm not going to argue with that because it's been relatively successful. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think of Rocket Man? Well, it's interesting. A lot of people ask me that, and the thing is that I think a lot of people don't realize it was made by Elton's film company. So I had complete control of what my character, the development of my character. I mean, I saw every script for the movie that came along, and um, I, I would sort of vet it and say, well, I would never say that, or no, that, that's, that's too off, off kilter for me. I, I wouldn't do that. Um, and so uh, I had 100% control over my character and input into the general movie itself. And so, yeah, I was, I was very happy with it. I loved Jamie's portrayal. Uh, I got to, you know, say, yeah, you know, there were people, there were other actors brought up and I kind of, <laughs> yeah, not too sure about that. Um, and, you know, Jamie's a very by the book method kind of actor. And I, I think he got the zeitgeist of it, you know. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, it worked for me. And I, I loved the movie. I loved the movie because um, it was a complete, um, it, was, it was a fantasy, and as you know, you know, the songs chronologically crossed over, and it was all over the place, but at the same time, there were moments in the film, like the creation of your song, which was spot on, and there's a great bit in that, where we're at the kitchen table, and I'm supposedly writing the lyrics to your song, while everybody's having breakfast. And I hand it over to Elton, and it, it, if, it, I don't know if you caught it in the movie, but Jamie, who, I mean, Jamie, Taron, who plays Elton, looks at it and goes, there's egg on this. And there actually was. <laughs> so I think, that was, uh, I think that was actually something that I threw in and said, you should have him say that, because that actually happened. And so that scene, that scene was very, very much outside of the fact that his, his mother and his grandmother weren't actually in the room. Um, it, it, it's very much how it happened. And also the, the scene when I went to see him in rehab was very much like it happened. So there were, there were scenes that were very, very real and mm -hmm. on the money, and then there were scenes that were complete fantasy. And I think the blending of the two worked very well. Agreed. Really, yeah, it gave you the feeling that the music gives you. Um, last question for this part of our little segment. Um, you, again, you write so beautifully about the early years which, with such great emotional detail. Um, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? I wouldn't want to know. I, you know, that kind of spoils the adventure. Um, I, I don't really regret anything in my life. I mean, there are a couple of things that I probably shouldn't have done, but you know what, it's, it's all part of the mix. Um, I don't know, I really, I really don't know. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you. As I say, I've had an incredibly interesting life. It's been wonderful, I've met some wonderful people, some who are no longer with us, and some who are still with us. And um, I'm proud that I've retained some of the friendships that I've, I've retained, you know, the people that I knew. And that, that's one of the great things about our career. I mean, it's like, and, and I include Elton in this, you know, I mean, we, we've had the same agent from day one, you know, the same guys in the band or, or for the most part. Um, and I, I, think, I think Mr. Johnson's here tonight, so. Uh, Woo! <laughs> 
So shout out to him who's been around a long time. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're blessed with the people in our lives. So uh, right. um, I, can't, I can't ask for more than that. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank man. you. Yeah, man. I think we have some more questions from the audience. First question, what about the songwriters from the great American songbooks, such as Cole Porter, et cetera? Well, you just named it, Cole Porter. That's my guy. The Gershwins. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of the, of the American songbook. I mean, those, those guys were the masters, you know. Um, uh, I, I think I talk about a few of them in the book. Um, those, those were the kind of guys that actually sat down together with the loosened ties and the shirt sleeves rolled up. Um, and and the, the body of work they left behind, no wonder it's still played today. I mean, they were magnificent. But if I had to name a favorite, yeah, Cole Porter would definitely be it. Great. Of all the lyrics you wrote, which melody that Elton came up with was the most surprising to you? Was there a song that was drastically different than what you had expected? I don't think so. I mean, a lot of the songs that we've written in the past, I think sometimes the, the content of the lyric dictates what kind of song it's going to be. I mean, if you write a lyric like Saturday Night, um, it's not going to be a ballad, right? You know, and <laughs> by, and again, if you write Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me and you read the lyric, it's not going to sound like Chuck Berry. So um, I think it's, that's more of the, the kind of answer that that question needs. Uh, I, I don't remember. I'm sure they, I'm sure they exist, but I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, no. Any standout memories of Tower Records on Sunset? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Tower, Tower Records was our mecca. In fact, that was one of the reasons we came here in the first place. Um, no, I'm serious. I mean, really, the th that at one point before we came in 1970, Elton had second thoughts about wanting to come to uh, L.A. and play the Troubadour because he felt that he was getting a, a foot up in the U.K. playing, you know, with Dee and Nigel. And... So he thought that maybe he might lose some of the momentum uh, if, if he came to the States. And I said, yeah, but there's Tower Records. And he goes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> this, is like, this is a disembodied voice. It's That's really good, weird. good. I have a quick one. Let me throw a quick yeah, one in. Yeah. Does anybody still call him Reg? Not, not, if they, not if they want to keep breathing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. No, I mean, that's, that's weird because, no, I, I, the guy changed his name. You know, I, that would be an insult, I think. How did a young Englishman from rural Lincolnshire write such perceptive and evocative lyrics about the American West and American history? Oh, well, that's because that's all I cared about growing up. I had no interest whatsoever in English history. Every, <laughs> everything, everything I ever listened to, read, or ingested in any kind of way came from America. I mean, I, I was an obsessive as far as narrative American country music was concerned, and American Westerns, whether it be John Ford or Sam Peckinpah, uh, those those were so inspirational to me that that's all I cared about. So, uh, I mean, I should, again, you know, was I born in the wrong place at the wrong time? Possibly. But, uh, yeah, it, it, those, those images ruled my life. Can you share any memories of producing the Hudson Brothers? <laughs> no. Succinct. <laughs> Sorry. What was your first major splurge after achieving success? Oh, I bought a Mini for 50 pounds. <laughs> and I couldn't drive. <laughs> 
What happened in Jamaica that Elton was recording his reggae song that you named Jamaica Jerk Off? <laughs> well, we were originally going to do the Yellow Brick Road album in Jamaica, but it turned out to be a complete disaster. Um, you know, I, you'd hit the piano. It, it was Byron, I, I believe it was Byron Lee's studio, dynamic sound, and the Stones had recorded Goat's Head Soup there. Um, I may get some of these details wrong. I'm sure there's people out there that know better, but um, it, it just didn't work out. I mean, I think Elton hit the piano keys and cockroaches came out of the, <laughs> the, the piano. But it, it, it was just, it wasn't destined to work. So we sort of, and we had a, great, we had a problem leaving the island too. It got kind of a little sh hairy at one point. So I guess that was my sort of kiss-off song to it, you know, <laughs> which I have a tendency to do at times. <laughs> a couple questions on uh, the song Leave On. Uh, was that based on a fictional character? And the different person asked the question, I love your song, Leave On. It's one of my all-time favorites and moves me every time I hear it. But what the hell do the lyrics mean? <laughs> It's a story full of metaphors, I guess. But, wow. you know, again, as I always, always say, I much prefer that people draw their own conclusions on songs they feel confusing because it's often far more interesting than what my idea was in the first place. Um, but again, I think that's just a story. It's, it's a fictionalized story. And, and people always ask me if I use... Uh, Levon from Levon Helm. I was a huge band fan, obviously, and I, but at the same time, I don't actually remember purposefully using his name. But then again, how many people are called Levon? So I, 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 I may have I may have acquired it without really thinking about it. But as far as what the song's about, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's a bit weird, but you know, it's. You know, it's about a guy who sells balloons. What can I tell you? <laughs> it's a genre unto itself. Yeah, really. <laughs> Bernie, you've told stories um, in song and now a book. Would you uh, entertain screenplays? Uh, same answer as before. No, probably not. I'll leave that to this guy. He's much better at it. <laughs> and far more successful than I would ever be. Very kind. Fondest memories of Australia? Oh, um, there was a great restaurant there in Sydney called La Strada that I loved. I would have, got, I would have gone to Australia just to go to that um, restaurant. But I loved Sydney. Sydney was fantastic. The people are amazing. And uh, I ingested more drugs there than I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so I think it was Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly you and Elton have a unique and enduring friendship but was there ever a time in your friendship where, where your friendship was tested? Yeah, when he wore that Don, Donald Duck suit in Central Park. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he knows I, was, I wasn't overly uh, supportive of some of his outfits. I didn't mind the, you know, to a certain point, but when you... Uh, well, actually, the Donald Duck suit came to bite him in the ass, actually, because he couldn't sit down in it, so he had to play the <laughs> piano standing up. So that was great. And then, but some of, the, some of the outfits, I mean, just so off the charts, it was ridiculous. I mean, the Statue of Liberty, Aladdin, um, I mean, unbelievable. So, you know that scene in Rocket Man, too, where I kind of mention it, and he, but he never, he never yelled at me like he does in the, in the movie. Um, yeah, so... Some of those outfits I, I was not happy about, no. Uh, favorite Beach Boys, Brian Wilson song? Ooh. Whew. Nice. Oh, that's impossible. I mean, you know, the, 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 title, the word genius 
gets banded about way too much these days in the same way as superstar. Everybody's a superstar now. Um, but genius, there's, there's very few of those. And uh, Brian Wilson definitely personifies the word genius. <laughs> Lovely man, beautiful man. Um, but I, I've seen him do things that I, I just can't imagine another musician doing. Any modern pop that affects you positively? There's, there's a lot of great people out right now. The thing is, I don't want to mention them simply because I might miss somebody out. Yeah. And I, I would love to give you a complete list of people. There's so many, there's really a lot of talent out there right now, especially, especially in the Americana field, I think. Yeah. You know. Great writers. You know, I, I adore our dear friend Brandy Carlisle, who I just love. Um, I like that. I like uh, Luke Bryant. Um, yeah, I, they, there's a lot of people. Yeah. If songwriting hadn't worked out for you, what do you think you would have done as a career? I always say I'd probably work in an ad agency because it would be the same, you know, coming up with slogans. I would have, th if, if I look for good titles, it would be the same kind of thing. So uh, I, certainly, I, I certainly would not be still living in Lincolnshire. I know that. Um, I would have, I'm sure I would have found my way here one way or another um, had it not been for the way it turned out, I would have, I would have found my way here. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I probably worked in advertising, but I don't know if I could have worked in the corporate world. I mean, it, it doesn't really gel with me, but who knows? I, I, maybe I'd, I would have developed differently. Um, several questions about process and writing. Um, do you, did you keep journals? Do you have a daily ritual or routine as you're working? No, because number one, I don't, I don't write every day. That's, that's, I'm not as, again, I have a problem with that whole the songwriter thing. I mean, I, people like, I admire people like somebody like Diane Warren who goes in her office every day and writes. You know, that's, that's not me, that's not, that's why I have trouble with regarding myself in, in the songwriter genre. Um, the only time I write now is if we're going to go in the studio, um, and that's been that, that way for years and years now. Uh, if Elton says to me, oh, we're going to go in the studio in a couple of months, uh, I want to make a new record, can you start working on some material, that's when I'll start writing. Um, I, I will keep notes if, if titles or, or lines come up to me at any particular point in time. I will make notes of them. But uh, I, I don't write co constantly. I mean, there's so many other things that I do outside of that. Has there ever been a moment when you doubted yourself as a writer? <laughs> no. <laughs> Again, no. Um, no, I mean, I've never had writer's block. I've never, uh, you know, the, the muse has already always been uh, very generous. Nope, never had, never had writer's block. If, if I have to, you know, if I had to go and write something right now, I could probably do it easily, yeah. It might not be very good, but I could do it. <laughs> when It'd be do you about know this carpet. Well, don't stop there. Come on. This is like something's <laughs> happening. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Carpet of many colors. Wait a minute. When do you know your lyrics are done and ready for the music? Um, yeah, it's a pretty simple process. I mean, I, I don't do a lot of rewriting. Um, so, I will, I, it, at most... At the most, it probably would take me, I don't know, a couple of hours to write something because I'll, I'll start work on it, then I might walk away from it and come back and reassess it and change a couple of things. But um, I, don't, I don't do a lot of reworking, no. Um, a question about the performer and the songwriter. 
Um, would you describe, Elton is on stage performing, there's an arena full listening to him dancing and they are reacting to that. What is the feeling, what, what are you feeling as the, the person who put those words to those songs? Oh, it never gets old. I mean, it's always enjoyable. Um, you know, I don't go to, or I, not anymore, but obviously, but um, it wasn't in my, uh, my nature to go to a lot of concerts. You know, I'd go to in some occasionally. I mean, on the, on the final tour, you know, which has lasted years, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, with, uh, allowing for COVID, of course. Um, I, I don't know, I probably only went to maybe 10 tops um, out of the hundreds that he did. Um, but it's always enjoyable. I mean, I love, I love to see all of the guys. I love to see the band. Um, I never, I, I've never sat in a seat for an Elton John concert ever uh, for the entire concert. Um, what I'll do is I just kind of wander around from the side of the stage to the other side of the stage go out to the sound booth, sit in the sound booth for, you know, a few songs. But I, I'm too restless. I, I, it's not in my wheelhouse to do that. Um, but, but I always, always find it enjoyable. I mean, when you've got a band as good as his band, you know, it's, it's hard not to enjoy it. Two more questions. Um, this one says, it's a question for both of them. Jan Wenner? <laughs> it should be goodbye, Jan Wenner, shouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no comment on that one. I've, I've made enough comments, that, I think. I, I wish he had interviewed Joni Mitchell, because there's no greater philosopher about music. Um, oh, no, she's not articulate enough, apparently. <laughs> well. Nor is Quincy Jones, nor is uh, Stevie Wonder, nor is uh, Patti Smith. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, next. Uh, last. <laughs> oh, great disembodied voice. Last question for the evening. What do you want your future grandchildren to understand about you? Oh, I was pretty good at what I did. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hell yeah. Just as long as they remember me, that's all. Boy, I just think, I think it's been a blast to, to talk about process and some of the memories and everything. And it, it, your spirit and your natural way of communicating is the voice of the book. And I just love the voice in that book. Well, thank and you so much. And it's your voice. So thank you. thank you for it. Thank you.